Today we think of Jesus entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and listen to the text in Matthew 21 verses 12 to 17 that speaks of the little children giving him praise. The people saw the signs of Jesus that filled them with wonder the Monday of Holy Week as he turned over the tables of the moneylenders and freed the doves, as he healed the sick and the lame in the temple, and as the children gave him praise. And of course, the Pharisees were not happy with that and became indignant. But Jesus tells us that God himself ordered praise from the mouths of his children. Mercy and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've been in a family, which all of us have, or raised a family, which some of us have, you know that when children are young, it can be a little bit hectic on a Sunday morning to get everybody ready for church. I remember a time when <clears throat> one of our boys couldn't find his belt for church and his pants were just a little bit too large. We didn't dare go to church without the belt. And as we're racing around, looking for the belt frantically, you know what he did? He said, Dad, maybe we should stop and pray about it. Now, we've been teaching them all along, you know, if you're in any kind of difficulty, you're in any kind of trouble, it's always a good thing to begin everything with prayer. And guess what Dad had not done? Stop to pray. It's from the mouths of children, isn't it, that we're often reminded of God's good words of Scripture because children hear the word and believe the word as it's written. Of a childlike faith that Jesus wants all of his people to have, isn't it? To take him at his word, to believe his promises. You know, during these midweek services, we've been following a theme, and that theme has been called the ironies of the passion. And the ironies of the passion, irony obviously means an outcome that's not expected. The ironies of the passion has been all of the statements that we run across in the scripture as Christ moves through Passion Tide, Passion Week, that are entirely out of context, out of the words of people from whom it was least expected. And this morning, we read in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through, uh, 12 through 17, the words of some children on the Monday after Palm Sunday. They were gathered in the temple together, Jesus was there. It said Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things that he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went off to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. We sing it, don't we? Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Hosanna means save. It's the Hebrew word for salvation, to save. And this morning in the temple, the children, having gone in that festal procession, are still resounding the praises of God. Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David. The child from David's line, the messianic savior who would come to redeem Israel. Hosanna to the son of David. The son of David has come to save. And the teachers of the law who were unhappy on Sunday 
with all of the hubbub and the songs of praise from the city and from all the pilgrims throughout the world that had returned for the Passover are out of sorts. In fact, they're indignant with these children. Do you hear what these children are saying? There's a statement of irony right there this morning. Now, God doesn't tell us what to think or how to react about every single incident in the Bible. He doesn't do that. But often he lets us to wrestle with these things, to understand them in the flow of the single message of Scripture. And that's a good thing. But that's not what he does in this morning's lesson because Jesus here is writing... But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things Jesus did, they saw. What did they see? The wonderful things. That word that Matthew uses there, wonderful, is full of wonder or wonder-filled. We get that word wonderful and we use it in different ways in our language. But it's a filled with wonder thing that Jesus was doing in the temple. What were they observing that was filled with wonder to them? Well, first of all, he drove out the money changers and the sellers of the doves and other gospels. We understand the people who were selling sheep and so forth. Drove them out. He didn't want his father's house to be a den of thieves and robbers. They didn't like it. They were amazed at what he was doing. What was so amazing? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but all of the records of history tell us what was going on in the temple. The chief priests were getting a cut of everything that happened. There was a little bit of kickback going on from all of these people at their various stations selling and changing money. You see, the chief priests had come up with the scheme that you couldn't use coins from around the world. You had to use the temple shekel. And so what do you do? Well, if you come and you don't have shekels, you go up to the money changing booth and they give you a rate of exchange which the chief priests manipulated in their favor. And then you took the shekels, which were, now you had far less money than you came with, and you went over to the booth over here to get your doves or your lambs or whatever it was you were going to sacrifice, and you paid an exorbitant price. It'd be like buying popcorn in the movie theater. Find a hot dog at a baseball game. You know what I'm talking about. You go to the grocery store, those hot dogs are 10 cents a piece. You buy them in a ballpark, we pay in six, eight bucks. It was crazy. And so all of their money was being used up, sucked in by all of this stuff going in the temple and Jesus was going to have none of it. He overturned it. He scattered the coins. He let the doves free. His father's house would not be a den of thieves and robbers. And the chief priests knew who he was talking about. They were amazed that he would do that. And then what's going on? But all of the sick and the lame and the the crippled and everybody are coming into the temple to see Jesus. And they're watching Jesus and all of these healing miracles that he's doing in the temple. This is his last day. He's going to heal as many as he can as he extends the love and mercy of God to the people. And they're filled with wonder and amazement seeing all of these signs taking place. And then there was another sign yet to be proclaimed. God brought forth the praise of faith. And from whom did he bring it? From the little children the little ones who had joined in the procession with their parents the day before, saw Jesus healing in the temple, doing these signs from God, overturning the tables. And what were the kids doing? 
They were flocking around and they were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. They were welcoming the Messiah King of Israel to save. God brings forth praise from little children and infants, Jesus said, as he quoted the scripture to the chief priests. He brings forth praise from these little ones. What a wonderful picture, a beautiful picture of a loving and trusting heart of a child who's learned about Jesus and who comes to the Savior, who welcomes him and sings the praise of God for the salvation he's about to bring. But five days later on the cross, four now because it's Monday morning even, And the chief priests, wonder-filled, observing all these things that God has done in and through His Son, are not filled with faith. What's the word that's being used there? They are indignant. Who do you think you are, Jesus? And when we read that, I imagine that we read that with some joy because we see what's going on. We see the wonder that's taking place. And we have a little heads up on those people who were there that day because they didn't fully understand as we have come to know through the Bible, Old and New Testaments, that Jesus had to die for the sins of the people, for the sins of all people. And we see that with the eyes of faith and wonder and joy wells up within us. But they were indignant. And yet in their indig- indignancy, does that, is that even a word? Indignancy? They bring to light the fact that it's God who brings forth these cries of glory and praise. Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying? You bet I do. Absolutely. Do you? Do you hear what's going on? No, they don't. They don't. But we understand it. We live in a world today where people oftentimes will believe most anything. People go to school and they're taught a single scientific hypothesis. Let's not call it a law because it's not a hypothesis. It's called evolution. Not the others in the field, just the one. And they understand, well, there's this need for struggle. There's this, you know, uh, what do they call it? The survival of the fittest going on. That everything doesn't really matter. And then they turn around and they say, but it does matter because people are starving in Africa. People are in need in Honduras. And their compassion goes out to them. And at the same time, you know, we're just kind of people of extremes, aren't we? We don't always understand what's in the middle. There are people out there today who say, And these are pastors, and these are professors at universities and seminaries. Not all, but many of them, surprisingly, in the end of the 20th, now the 21st century. These things, this book, uh, this Bible is just a human record made of legends and myths. And they'll say, and this Jesus, yeah, we know from history Jesus lived. We know that he died on the cross. We know that people said he rose from the grave, but you can't really take the scripture as it's written They'll vote. We've talked about that before with little black and white marbles on the words in the scripture that they imagine are true or not true. They came out some years ago with the Lord's Prayer. Seven words, they said, were original to the text. The rest of it was all made up by Christians a long time ago. The Bible calls that madness, craziness. They look at us who take the Lord at his word. Some of these people say, well, you guys just need to believe in a Disneyland in the sky. 
You poor people. How dumb can you be? That's what we're seeing this morning with the chief priests in the temple. Jesus, who do you really think you are? Come on, you're just a guy. Maybe you're a good teacher, you're a good rabbi. Maybe, maybe you're a prophet. Okay, we, we don't want to say that. But the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of Israel, how many of these guys have popped up over the years? We're not buying it. Do you hear what these kids are saying about you, Jesus? Are you hearing those words? But for those of us who have been given a gift, the wonderful gift of faith, which God works in our hearts, for those of us who see what's going on, not from a human perspective, but from the Father's perspective, for you and I who don't believe in a Disneyland in the sky but believe that there is a God who loves us and cares about us and who came to earth in flesh and blood to die that we might live. For you and I who believe the foundation of the faith, the Christian faith which has taken the world by storm since the time of the Savior. You and I who have been given the gift of a simple, trusting, childlike faith who do not put reason above God. We hear the children singing and we hear ourselves singing. We hear them singing the praises of the Savior as we open our hymnals every Sunday and now Wednesday nights and coming up Thursday and Friday and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday and we open those hymnals and we sing the praise of Him who was born, who died, who rose again that we may have life in His name. And our hearts are uplifted by the Spirit of God through the Word. And we're not amazed that the children through the Spirit and the Word are proclaiming the praises of God. Because this whole thing God has laid out step by step because it must take place. It must take place. Because He loves you. It must take place because He loves you. Jesus, do you hear what these children are saying about you? Yes. Yes. From the lips of children and infants, God has ordained praise. Jesus not only heard what they were saying, he approved of it. He approved of it. That's exactly what his father wanted to happen. God ordains praise from the lips of his children. And there it's the little ones, the young ones. But after that, it's all of his children, you and I, who have been received into his family through the gift of holy baptism. And because of the word in that water and because of the spirit who comes with that word, our lives are transformed into lives of praise and worship. The very nature of a Christian is to worship the Lord to give praise and honor to his holy name, to receive from him the gift of faith and the gift of word and sacrament that he so gently and tenderly places in our hearts so that through these things we may be lifted up and encouraged and strengthened to walk the life that he would have us walk, to carry the cross that he would have us carry in this world. Until until he walks with us and bears that cross that we bear, until he walks with us through the valley of the shadow of death, and we arrive with him 
in the glorious light of paradise. God has created you to sing forth his praise. On this morning as we sing Hosanna loud, Hosanna, ride on, ride on in majesty and all the familiar hymns of Palm Sunday. Think about the joy. Think about the palm branches waving, the carpet on the road, but think most importantly of the mission of our Savior who's come to express his love for you. On Good Friday, by his word this morning, we humble our hearts. We know that we have been in rebellion to God. And contrition, we come forth and we say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. And he does. He says to you, I am the atoning sacrifice for your sin. He says to you, your sin has been washed away in the flood of baptism. He says to you, come and receive my very body and blood in with and under this bread and wine for you to eat and drink for the forgiveness of your sins. And he says, no matter what may happen in this world, or where you may go, I am with you always. Always. To the very end of the age. Hosanna loud, Hosanna. The little children sang, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord. Amen. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock with Bible study and Sunday school at 1030. Or find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net.